Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 10th episode of Growing a Consulting Firm Practice. I suppose it is a milestone posting our 10th episode of this new podcast channel. For those of you listening on iTunes, remember that the video version of this is in YouTube. And because it is a video based podcast, some of the content, I would say maybe more than 50% of the content we produce is best viewed in video. In today's episode, I want to build on an episode about, I think it was two or three episodes ago, where I said that it's no such thing as a good or bad reputation or market positioning, because a reputation is only good or bad relative to the client segment you tend to pursue. And if you change the client segment you pursued, your positioning or your reputation could turn out to be an asset. So this is a very important uh, observation because I feel that quite a lot of boutique firms and even large firms, they are not poor at what they do. They're not weak at what they do. They don't lack a reputation, but because of the market they are pursuing, their traditionally strong reputation is not as helpful. It's not much of an asset. And I want to explain this in a slightly different way here, right? So as a start, I'm going to give you a bit of an exercise. Assume you graduated from what many consider to be one of the great business schools of the world, if not the greatest business school, Harvard Business School. Now let's assume you graduated from Harvard Business School. You worked at McKinsey for two years. You attended Stanford as an undergraduate, another school that many consider to be one of the great schools. Now, assuming that's your background, that is your pedigree, so to say, do you believe that if you set up a boutique firm, you should target Fortune 500 CEOs. Now, the listener group to this episode is going to be a broad spectrum. We could plot them as a normal distribution. Some of you listening to this will be Harvard Business School graduates who did work at McKinsey and probably went to Stanford or a similar school. But that'll be one end of the dumbbell of a normal distribution. The middle will be people who didn't go to HBS, didn't work at McKinsey, didn't go to Stanford. And on the furthest end, and there'll be a subgroup that probably doesn't have a degree but trying to launch a consulting firm, which, again, you can be very successful doing that, right? Depending on which group you are in that bell curve, that normal distribution, your answer is going to be very different because you know different things about yourself. For those of you who have this idealistic version of what it means to go to Harvard Business School, work at McKinsey, graduate from Stanford, you would think that is an unassailable resume or position to have. And of course, you can serve a Fortune 500 CEO. For those of you who went to Harvard Business School, spent two years at McKinsey and went to Stanford or a similar school and realized that it's actually pretty difficult to be successful no matter what your background, you may not think you can serve Fortune 500 CEOs. But who's right? Well, here's an exhibit I put together, which I think is a good explanation. The majority of people will think you have nothing important to say. That is a fact of life. No matter where you work, no matter what you know, the majority of people will think you have nothing important to say because the majority of people don't care about you. You walk on the street and you pick 10 people and start talking about something. Seven out of 10 are going to think you're wasting their time. Knowing that... You need to make sure the right people think you have valuable advice. So what I've done here is I've plotted a distribution of clients from Fortune 500 CEO, below that Fortune 1000 CEO, below that large business CEO, below that medium business CEO, below that small business CEO, and below that a one-person company, right? On your left-hand side, I have the McKinsey alum, two, uh, Harvard Business School graduate, two years experience at McKinsey. On the right-hand side, have an Ernest & Young consultant with three years of experience who went to the Rotman School of Business, which is a very good school in Canada. But I picked Rotman because even though it's a good school, it's not a well-known brand. Most people around the world won't know that brand. Now, the question here is, you've got this McKinsey, two-year alum, Harvard Business School, and you've got this Ernest & Young, three years experience, graduate of Rotman MBA program in at the University of Ontario in Canada. You've got these two people. So the question is, which segment of the market should they serve? Should they serve the Fortune 500 CEO or one of the five options below that? Now, 
Most people would say, well, you know, the guy was at McKinsey for two years, went to Harvard Business School. Of course, he should serve the Fortune 500 CEO clients. What you need to understand is positioning is always relative. The best positioning fails if you apply your positioning to the wrong market. Here's a question for you. If you think the McKinsey alum who went to Harvard Business School should serve Fortune 500 CEOs. Why would a Fortune 500 CEO hire a boutique consulting firm staffed by an ex-McKinsey consultant with just two years of experience from Harvard Business School, he graduated from Harvard Business School, when that CEO has exposure to many more similar and better consultants and doesn't have a problem paying for them from McKinsey itself? There is an excess of supply of this prestige at the level of the Fortune 500 CEO, which means that prestige is less valuable, right? So if you're this consultant and you want a meeting with the CEO of Home Depot or the CEO of Ford or the CEO of Medtronic or the CEO of, of Kaiser, whatever it is, you're competing against other people with similar pedigrees. At that level, so-called pedigree like brand names doesn't mean much. In this situation, whereby there's an excess of supply of these titles, it would be much better for this graduate to pursue maybe a large business CEO or a medium business CEO because that CEO is unlikely to have access to such skills and advice. That's what you have to understand. The Ernest & Young consultant can target Fortune 500 CEOs, large business CEOs, small business CEOs. Now, here's the thing which you have to understand. The Ernest & Young consultant can be more successful if they target the right market which appreciates and values their credentials. I have seen people with McKinsey, BCG backgrounds. They'll tell you about all the amazing things they've done. But if you look at the markets they're actually serving, they are serving small businesses. They'll charge $1,000 an hour, $2,000 an hour because they can do that because that small business doesn't have access to better people because the better people don't serve that market. So in this situation here, the McKinsey alum could end up targeting Fortune 500 CEOs, but he could be very unsuccessful. He has to discount his rates so dramatically just to get the work. But the Ernest & Young consultant can be serving medium and small business CEOs, but he can charge much more because, relatively speaking, the small business CEO sees the Ernest & Young the Ernest and Young's consultant's background as being very elite. There's a lack of supply of those skills to that market. And you see this very often. Lots of people work at BCG McKinsey. They're, they'll do one of two things. They initially try to target the top end of the market. Then they realize, you know what, my pedigree, there's an excess of supply of it. I've got to go low end. So they keep going low end and they raise their rates. That's how the market works. A successful consultant is one who what? Serves the most important leaders in business or is able to generate the most revenue to continuously be able to develop themselves? It's the latter answer. It is not a bad thing to not serve the top end of the market because you could help that smaller business or medium-sized business become significant in the long term. So as you're thinking about your positioning, always remember this. If you have something to say, there is a market for you. And if you are not successful, it is almost always because you have not found the right market. Or if you found the market, you don't know how to package and deliver your knowledge into that market. So when someone comes to me and says, well, Michael, I worked at this firm. I don't think I have the pedigree. I say, hold on a second. You've got nine years of experience. You have the pedigree. You know what you want to say. You know how to say it. It's usually a market positioning problem. And if you found the right market, there's usually the way you're packaging what you are saying. But do not assume that if you have the right pedigree, right being what many consider to be the most elite pedigree, you're automatically going to make the most money. Because when you have an elite pedigree and you compete with other people in an elite pedigree, you have to be the best. If you're not the best, you can't serve the top end of the market. But if you're not the best, you can serve the low end of the market and still make a lot of money. If you don't have a elite pedigree, you can make even more money if you can serve the right market and be able to make them successful. That's what you've got to think about, right? So what you've got to ask yourself are what are your credentials? Why do people listen to you? 
Then are those credentials valued by your existing clients, right? Is that your right client group? If it's the wrong client group and they don't value your credentials, then it's okay. Go to the right client group. What credentials do you need to develop that your existing clients will value? I need to develop. This is actually a trick question. There's almost no credentials you need to develop because the credentials you have is going to be valued by someone and you just need to find them. What credentials should you stop investing in? My advice is almost all credentials you should stop investing in. I know that's going to sound counterintuitive. When I say credentials, I don't mean a degree. I mean a certain skill. Why do I say that? Because the skills you already have, you need to find a market for them versus developing a skill you didn't have. Once you've exhausted finding a market for your existing skills, then you develop a new skill. But it's not the other way around. So think about this as you plan developing your firm. It's, when someone tells me they don't have the right pedigree, they don't have the right profile, that's why they're not successful, that's not your problem. It's about finding the right market and figuring out a way to deliver what you know to them. But just remember this, right? Always look at this. People you know and you see, you always find people who talk about their high-end pedigree almost always when they start out their own firm, they'll be serving the low end of the market because they understand the differential. Well, even if they don't understand the differential, they try to serve the high end of the market. No one wanted to see them because there's an excess of supply of pedigree. And they were forced to go lower, 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 lower until they found that segment of the market that is low enough to value what they have, but is also willing to pay them enough for it. And that's what all organizations do. I mean, surely Toyota Camry would love to sell their cars for $100,000, but no one's going to buy it for $100,000. So they keep on going as low, as low, as low, where they find a segment of the market that values what they're offering and is willing to pay enough for Toyota to have a very successful Camry division. That's how the market works. You need to do the same thing. Now, insiders, you can see us do this with a boutique firm. And for those of you who want to see more of our thinking, remember if you go to firmsconsulting.com and submit your details for free, you can get access to some of our more advanced material as a preview. If you have questions, post in the comments and we'll try to answer them in follow-up episodes.